Well, first of all, I just like to thank everyone uh, for giving me the chance to speak and uh, sorry for the technical problems at the beginning. Seems like from what I see in the chat, everyone's hearing now okay, so that sounds good. Um, I, I, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's been a fun to prepare for this and give us a little break from uh, the times that we're in now. So um, feel free, you know, throughout, if you have questions, please let me know. I think from, from listening to these a couple of times myself, I know the more uh, interactive they are, the more interesting they are. So, so don't, uh, don't be shy and just let me know, either type it in um, or, uh, or uh, let the host know and, and then we can go from there. Um, I will share my screen now if I can, and, and we'll kind of try and go through some uh, some PowerPoints. Um, my plan is to kind of give you a bit of an overview. I mean, obviously, the pistol is not something that I've come up with. It's used by countless coaches in countless different varieties, um, and that's one of the things that I um, I like about it, but I'll try and share a bit of what what I've done over the past years and and um, at the beginning why I've gone to this I over the time I've been coaching I've certainly experimented with a lot um, based a bit on the personnel that I've had and and changing philosophy obviously but this is really the first one that I've I've found and felt so comfortable with um, and I feel like I can adapt it to whatever uh, uh, personnel I get to um, so I think that's one of the things hopefully that you can all take away from this is that I think you can find a way to integrate this into uh, whatever um, whatever group you have in a given year and you can try and move the concepts uh, through year one, year two, year three if you're in CCAA or uh, year five if you're youth sports or if high school, you know, if you can build on things, it, it allows you to make it as complex as you want. Um, and that's one of the things that I really liked about it was I think it can evolve with the, with the groups that you have. So we'll get right into it. I just wanted to start, I guess, with my with the things that are important for me offensively to start with. Um, and to me, like regardless of what offense I've been running, these uh, these five and especially the first three have really been um, the most important. So spacing, um, meaning that your players are uh, moving uh, away from each other and, and together. And I always do this kind of this motion when I'm trying to explain it to the to the players where they're they're not always the same distance apart from one another but they're coming together and then they're spreading out they're coming together and then they're spreading out. Um, and the more space you have um, uh, on the floor, the easier it is for your uh, better plays, better play uh, to show what they can do and to take advantage of, 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 of matchups. So spacing for me is probably the, the primary and most important uh, offensive concept that there is. Uh, the second one is ball movement. I think it's fairly obvious. Um, the more that ball moves, um, the better off you're going to be, and you're going to be able to almost always generate a better shot um, if you get uh, ball the ball movement from at least one side to the second side, if not the third side. Um, player movement, same uh, same idea. I think having players standing still um, can kill your offense very, very quickly. Later on, I have a couple of clips of, of, uh, of my team playing that I'll, I'll try and show you. And I think that's one of the things that stood out is we didn't do a very good job um, with player movement at times. And you'll see there's players on the on the, the back side or the weak side who are really just standing and watching. And it allows their defensive player to, um, to key in on the ball instead of having to worry about uh, guarding. And for me, that you know that allows you to defensively to, to really take away a certain action or a certain player. Um, which is obviously not what we want on the off. Uh, the fourth one is mix, misdirection. Um, so you, for me, I, re like, I like to really have something going one way and then coming back uh, the other way and try and stay away from just one ball screen on one side of the floor or, or one uh, back screen or whatever, you, whatever you're doing, but not have it on, on one side. Have it look like it's going one way um, and... Uh, and then move the ball back to the other side of the floor and, and attack the rim from the opposite side. And that's one of the things, you know, I, I had the chance to work for some, some very good coaches early on as an assistant and, and Dave DeViro, who had been at McGill for a long time and Ottawa before that is on to Ryerson now, but, um, um, uh, so, uh, the, the misdirection was, I hope, hopefully the last thing that I was at there, um, Dave DeViro at McGill was, was, um, great at showing me how, um, how to use the, the weak side as a setup for what you really wanted to have happen um, and creating an action where it looked like um, the ball was going to that side. And, and one of the things that, that I always try and tell the players is 
if you know if the defense takes away the left then you can go right if they take away the bounce pass then you can throw the lob pass there's always more than one um, there's always more than one way to get the ball uh, to where you want it to go and using that misdirection makes it so much easier uh, and then the last one is pressure on the defense so I, I mean I really think the longer I go the more I coach um, if you are walking the ball up the floor and setting up an offense it makes it so much easier to defend the ball screen. And it's amazing how well uh, teams can hedge defensively uh, or chase a down screen um, or switch or do stuff that's different based on the personnel that you have um, if you walk the ball up the floor uh, because they get a chance to get ready and, and talk and set themselves up. And the weak side does a much better job of setting themselves up uh, to rotate. So getting the ball up the floor for me, I think, is maybe – the way to, to make your offense look better than, uh, than anything else other than having great players, obviously. Um, but if you can put pressure on the defense in transition um, and get up the floor, then it just makes it, um, it makes all your screen actions uh, work uh, more efficiently. And it, it forces the defense to be in a reactionary uh, situation all the time. And I think that's one of the goals that you want to have on offense is to, to put the defense on their heels and not allow them to dictate uh, what they're going to be trying to do, but always be reacting to what you're doing. So those five things, spacing, ball movement, player movement, uh, misdirection, and pressure on the defense are kind of the five things that I, I um, try and write on the board every time when I'm going to start, uh, start talking about offense. Um, player types uh, and attributes. So part of the reason that, um, that I went to this offense is in, in Quebec and I think probably in most places, there's a plethora of guards. You can find guards all over the place, and it's pretty tough to find, um, to find you know, players with any kind of size and skill. And what I was in my early days at Champlain, we had, we had some, some pretty decent size with you know, a couple of forwards in the 6'5", six, 6'7", six, 6'8", six, 6'9", six, range. Um, but further and further as we go, we have fewer and fewer of those. Um, and it became a, a choice between either asking a guard to play a forward spot um, or having a forward who was, had some size but really just wasn't talented enough to be playing at that level. So being switching to this kind of offense has, has allowed us to essentially have four guards on the floor. Um, and you'll see like the point guard and the shooting guard are essentially the same player for me. Um, they, you know, I, we, we run it without numbers, so there's not a one or a two. It's, it's um, position-based, uh, which is a bit hard to, to teach, but I think it gives you more fluidity and transition as well. Uh, but the things that I look for if I'm recruiting a point guard or, or that we want to have on our team is, number one, they have to be unselfish, and that's pretty much for every single player on the floor for this. The ball has to be able to move, and if you don't, if you get the ball sticking, you know, two dribbles, three dribbles, four dribbles, and more than that, then the whole thing kind of falls apart. So especially the ones and the twos have to be unselfish. They have to be able to make, um, see the floor and make great passes. Um, the, the pistol offense is a bit, um, the pass needs to be made to where the player is going to be. I, I suppose all of them are like that, but more so because it's, it's more read-based. You, you need to see the other players um, and where they're going. Um, and get the ball to to where they're to where they're going to be and when they're going to be there. Um, they all need to be able to shoot. The ones in the twos need to be able to shoot the ball. They they need to be able to handle the ball. But you don't need to have a um, like a tremendous breakdown point guard. Uh, the pistol really will allow you to hopefully one or two dribbles and then pass the ball up the floor. Uh, they need to be very good in the ball screen. Uh, especially with making decisions, not necessarily scoring off the ball screen, but making decisions. And then they got to have a go-to move at the end of the clock. I saw someone put up their hand there. Was there a question? Oh, two people have questions. Uh, I can only see one from Jen. I have none right now up on the mic. If you guys have questions, just put them in the Q&A spot. Um, I can address the, the hands up thing. Uh, but the Q&A, I'll just kind of give them to you as it comes. Excellent. Um, so then your, uh, your small forward. Um, this is the guy that, that really needs to build to uh, make shots and score. Um, they're generally not going to have the ball in their hands, uh, bring the ball up the floor. They are going to be the ones that are finishing at the rim, finishing uh, uh, with a shot. 
they're going to end up um, with the ball in a scoring position as opposed to your one or two are going to be more facilitators. Um, passing, I'm not as concerned about with, with this one, although obviously he does need to be able to pass or she. Uh, they need to be a fairly good ball handler and they need to be pretty good in the ball screen. But this is a player that um, can be a little bit selfish and a, one of, you know, a guy that's a bit of a, you know, a, a ball goes in, their ball doesn't go in. Um, but someone who's not gun shy and is willing to, 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 to score. And I think that you need to have one of those guys that can just get a bucket when you need a bucket. And for me, that would be the, the, the small forward. The power forward, um, you know, is your, is your, could be sometimes your, your trail guy. Usually it's going to be my center that's trailing. But this guy is primarily a, a spacer on the floor. Uh, he needs to be able to make shots um, so that you can't just leave him totally alone. Uh, they need to be capable with the ball in press break or uh, in a situation where they have to go dribble handoff. Uh, they need to be a very good decision maker. Uh, when they have the ball, you know, they often get, they're often the one that's going to make uh, the pass that leads to the score. Um, and they need to be able to see that, uh, you know, with, with anticipation. Uh, they don't need to be a great, uh, a great scorer, but they need to build the score a little bit. You know, if teams switch and they have a, a five foot 10 point guard on them, you need to build the score with the, with your back to the basket. And then you need to be a, a very good screener or a good screener because you're going to be one of the ones that are, are setting a lot of the, um, a lot of the screens. Co Coach, and then the last one. Question yeah. for small forward. Um, oh. Can they be more of a scorer? Or do you need them to be a shooter in that position? What's your preference on that? My preference is that everyone can shoot. Um, for me, no. again, <laughs> as I go along, um, if, if someone can't shoot the ball, I think, it becomes more and more detrimental to offense as you go higher and higher up. And that's one of the things I run into all the time with, with kids in high school when they come from high school to me and they were great scorers in high school and they averaged 25 points a game and they can't understand why they only averaged six or seven in their first year. And it's because once you get to a level where there's a scout, then everyone either knows you can or you can't shoot. And if you can't shoot, teams that are good will not go out and guard you. And if they don't go and guard you, it's real hard to put your head down uh, and get to the rim. So for me, the, you've, you don't have to be a great shooter, but you've got to be a good enough shooter that you can't just let a lot of guys stand at the three-point line and not go out and guard him. Um, you've got to be a threat to score from there. And all the one, the two, the three, and the four have to be a threat. The only exception would be, um, would be the center. Um, I mean, again, if he can shoot, it's just an added bonus. I think it's more important for him to be like, this is what I got here, a, a great screener, uh, has to be a great post-up scorer so you can throw the ball into him and, and get a basket. Um, and then the bigger the motor, the better, because they're going to set a lot of screens and they're going to they're gonna roll and chase up to ball screens. And it, it takes a lot of work to do that. You'll see the personnel that I have on my team last year, we, we have a 6'8 you know, kid who's probably 270 pounds, um, who's headed out to St. Uh, Saint of X next year, but uh, his, you know, his motor, if he had a bigger motor, he would have scored 25 instead of 18 a game. Um, and that's, uh, that's something, again, I mean, it's hard to find, but, but uh, the better the motor, the better. And if, if your center can't, isn't willing to work, then it won't, it, the, the offense won't run because he won't be there to set the, um, set the screens when they need to be there. Makes sense. Um, so the advantages and disadvantages, um, I, the flow from transition to half court is excellent. All right. And this is not an offense where you can stand up and call uh, a play. Um, nine times out of 10, you get a rebound and the, the, it's one or two dribbles and they should be across center court. Um, so it, you've got to be willing to live with some, some mistakes um, because it, it goes to be successful. It needs to go quickly. Um, it's very difficult to scout because it's based on reads and, and you know again in, in Quebec in our in our in my league we play each other twice at U Sports the teams play each other four times so the the more predictable your offense is the easier it is to defend because they just get the defensive players get so used to it and if you don't have an automatic counter um, to, to option A or option B then it then it becomes much easier to defend. Um, it allows you to attack mismatches very easily because uh, everyone gets a chance to, to have the ball in their hands. And if you go back to what I had at the beginning, spacing, ball movement, and player movement, if you have those three things, then you can attack a mismatch because
so it has um, it has natural flow, uh, and what I mean by that is it's um, it, it's kind of intuitive, and and if you have players that are are fairly high IQ players, often they they just start to do stuff on their own that you haven't really talked about, but it makes sense, and that's one of my favorite things as a as a coach is is when players do something and you've never talked about it, and you're like, oh yeah, that's that's really good. We should add that. Let's do it again. Um, and I, when, you, when you're trying to build an offense or, or find something that's going to work for your team, I think giving, you have to let players have the freedom to, to, to go to their strengths. And um, when you have the spacing, the, the ball movement and the player movement, um, that really allows you to, to do those things. Um, there is guard heavy play. And, and like I said, for me, that's an advantage because we have a ton of super talented guards in Quebec um, and that works out well. But you, you need to have you need to have talented guards for it to work. Uh, the disadvantages you need talented guards for it to, to work. Um, you need to have kids that can shoot the ball. If you can't space the floor, uh, it really doesn't go very well. Um, it can look awful at times, and you will go through stretches where you just can't make a shot, or you just can't um, you just can't make a decision, and and it just looks like the worst thing ever. And I think you have to to um, live through that. Um, and you know, like watching the NBA games sometimes gives me um, gives me hope when you see, uh, you know, an NBA team that that you know is a good team and and they've won 50 games or 60 games and and they just look awful and nothing works. Um, and I think if you have a really structured, really set offense, um, then you don't go through those really bad spells. Um, if you have a more free flowing uh, offense, then then you're for sure going to have that that time. But you have to be willing to just uh, uh, fight through it. Uh, and then it requires unselfish players. So, I mean, if you got to choose who you're recruiting well, um, and if you do end up with um, players that are unselfish, or sorry, that are selfish, you have to make tough decisions about whether you're going to let them play or not. And I, you know, that's one of the things that I ran into a lot this year was having um, a player that could score so well that they struggled to stay within this within the system and and I think all of us as coaches have probably been there more times than than not um, and you know it's got a decision that you got to make but that's um, finding players that are unselfish I think is really important to, to make it happen all right um, so there are four really key actions and and you know at the end I have a whole bunch more uh, more uh, more drawings or diagrams of, of the plays, but these are the things that happen over and over again. Um, and are they like the happen at the beginning, some of them happen uh, in the middle and some of them happen at the end of the action. But whenever you're in a pistol set, you're going to end up with some, uh, one of these four, uh, if not maybe two of the four happening uh, at least once. Um, so the first, the first one is the basic pistol set where you have your one and that one guy is usually come from up the, up the floor like this. You have your two, your trail, uh, and then your four and your three spaced out. The four and the three ideally can be interchangeable. If, if the four guy can really shoot the ball, um, then it makes it a lot easier. So the basic action uh, is you have the one and the two coming up to interact um, and then the five coming to set the screen. And the, the key thing is you want to have that, that, five guy trailing in he's going to be setting either a ball screen for the one a ball screen for the two or a flare screen for the two and any one of those three three things can happen depending on um, what the defense does and that's what I was saying before where it's very read based you have to work constantly on making um, the reads uh, so the most common thing that will happen um, on this uh, one to two is that they like to switch defenses are going to switch guard to guard um, so your two guy here is going to look to slip to the rim. And if the defender kicks that away, then the, the five will be there to set the, set the flare screen. And the two guy will pop up here. And this is a very good spot uh, to catch it. On the next one, we should see uh, the first one. The first clip is of the, the most basic option, which is the give and go. And it's a good um, – it shows you the speed, the advantage of speed. So, I mean, here's a, a defensive rebound that we have where we're just getting up the floor. Um, and super simple give and go, and it's going to result in an in a open three. He ends up missing the shot, but you see when we get up the floor to here, we have, we have great space. Um, we have great space because the players have sprinted. Every time I make that, I can't stop it. Every time we, we, um, we sprint up the floor, uh, we, we, uh, we get up quickly, and we make this pass from – I don't know why I can't stop it. 
uh, we make that pass from the full court and that, that, that 30 foot or 40 foot, foot pass um, is really important to allow, uh, to put pressure on the defense. Uh, and that's what allows that guy to, they're out of position at the guard spot and that's what allows him to get to the rim so easily. And then he makes an also unselfish play to kick it out. Um, but that, boy, sorry about all the flipping back and forth. Um, that's, that's what I like with pressure up the floor. Okay, so now the next one um, is the slip. So where we we're saying that often what's going to happen is when you get that guard to guard um, interaction, you have a uh, slip uh, from the screener. So you're going to see the ball comes up the floor. The player that sets the screen uh, is going to read that and, and read the switch and slip. Uh, unfortunately, we end up turning the ball over, but they, they, make the, uh, they make the right decision. So we end up throwing it away there. Probably a better option would have been going back to the, the big guy at the top. Um, but that's that – pause just doesn't want to work for me. Um, that's really the action that we're looking for on the if they, uh, if they slip the screen. Um, so now this, the next one um, is the middle ball screen. So after that flare has happened, um, we've thrown the ball over the top. Uh, so the two guy is catching here. When the, when the ball is with the one in this spot and the five is setting your, your flare screen, because this, this side is very, very open, um, it allows for a very easy slip from the five. And if you don't get that slip from the five, what happens is that your five guy ends up chasing towards the rim. Your two guy can end up with a shot right away. Or if you don't get the shot, you're going to end up with uh, your five chasing back uh, to set a middle ball screen. Um, I forgot to draw the arrows on here, but on the back side, we, on, on this action, we'd be going flare screen to try and occupy the back side of the defense and, and allow these two guys to have an interaction. And this is where if you have, um, you have a big six, seven, six, eight, six, nine center um, rolling to the rim in this scenario, it puts a ton of pressure on the defense here because they almost always have to switch this screen, which puts your guard, their guard against your forward. Um, and it, it puts it in a very favorable matchup for you. So I think the next clip here is we're going to um, we're going to come up and run the um, run the flare, and the guy will shoot it immediately uh, because he goes underneath. So there's the handoff. So there's the flare. The big guy goes underneath, and it leaves it pretty open to to shoot the ball. And that's one of the things that you get a lot when you're playing with four guards or or you know guys that can that can shoot is the opposing team's player, uh, their four guy is guarding our guard right now. And that's why he, he's just naturally inclined to go to the rim uh, on the ball screen defense and, or the flare, the flare screen defense. And he gets stuck underneath, which makes it a very, a very open shot, very makeable shot uh, here for, for our, uh, you know, he ended up being about 30%, 35% three point shooter. Uh, the next one um, is we're going to get back to the middle ball screen action. So the same kind of thing, ball gets up the floor. We use that initial screen. A bit slow to give it up there, one dribble too many. And now we're gonna come back in middle ball screen. And this is where we should have the backside flare happening and we just, we just don't, we don't, we don't execute on that, um, on that instance. But you can see, like, you know, he ended up making this crazy layup, but you know, the pass should have gone out. And if we had been flaring, we would have had a guy wide open in here because he would pin in one one of those guys. Um, the other thing that you get, yeah, you know, I don't. I mean, I don't like the decision that that my player made here. But our big kid is rolling to the rim, and you can see the player that he's up against is eclipsed. You know, he's just so much bigger than that guard. Um, so this guy ends up taking the toughest shot available uh, and making it. But he has three other very good options, and that's because we've collapsed the defense. You've got one, two, three players, four players defensively with their feet in the paint. And you've got guys that are pretty well spaced uh, on the perimeter, ready to shoot the ball. Coach, um, when they're coming off the flare action there, is it the player's read to come off the flare or take that to the hoop? Or are you presetting that? Like when you come back to your mid ball screen, is that a call or is that just a read? So it should be a read based on what the defense has done. 
Um, if if the um, if the defensive player goes underneath the flare screen and the player that's catching the ball, getting the flare, can can shoot it, then it's pretty much got to be an automatic shot. I, I I love threes, and if if like I said at the beginning, if you guys if you've got players that can shoot the ball, um, for me an uncontested three or mildly contested three is about as good as it gets. Um, so if he goes under, then then shoot it. If not, then because of the the fact that he went under. You get um, you pretty get a good angle on the rescreen, and and when you get that guy rolling to the rim, um, that's that's where you can get a, a pretty easy layup. If they're a bad defensive team, if they're a good defensive team or better defensive team, like the team that we're playing here, is they collapse and they they force you to either make a tough layup or kick it out. And again, you need shooters that can make you pay the price, make the defensive team pay the price for for collapsing the the paint. I'll show you that one one more time. So there's the initial ball screen. The flare, not great flare. And then here comes that ball screen where you get them coming downhill. We did a pretty good job of spacing out on the flare. Our point guard holds onto the ball for one or two dribbles too many. It takes too long to make, um, make decisions. Um, but even with the slower decisions, we end up with a, with a, a, a pretty good set. Oh, there it is one more time. Should have been a better flare screen, and he, he should have looked to slip at the beginning. Um, so here's the, um, I mean, we had, I only had one of those big kids last year. Um, and so we often were playing with five guards on the floor. Um, so this is what we would do um, when we had that guard on the, uh, on the five guards on the floor, and we weren't going to roll a guard to the rim because it just, it wasn't, you know, it's not a great matchup. Um, so what we do is we call a blur screen where you, the NBA is obsessed with them now, where you come and bake the screen and then essentially sprint to the, sprint to the three point line. I, I, you know, I only started doing it halfway through the year, but it, it really has turned into one of the most effective, um, most effective offensive maneuvers plays um, that I've, I've seen. And it's so simple and so uh, low risk um, that, you know, I've, become equally obsessive with it, I think, as the, um, as the NBA. So here's, uh, here's how it looks. There's the handoff. There's the flare screen. Now he's going to come back and middle ball screen. But you see that their number 22 is a forward guarding our guard. And Brad Buff is an excellent defensive team, but they hedge all their ball screens. Um, and he's going to hedge no matter what. And that allows our guy to pop to the, uh, pop to the perimeter. Again, if you look on... And, and that, those options, uh, hopefully you have time to get to it at the end there, but those options allow you to make it really totally read-based where they, if they're overplaying that entry pass from the one to the two, then you use a ball screen. And if they were overplaying the entry pass from the one to the two, then that ball screen will be uh, a pretty effective ball screen because the defender's not in a good position to either switch or, or, uh, or hedge. So the next one um, is uh, back screen to a post-up. And this happens when you have, uh, if you have a, a big guard, I, I happen to be lucky this year to have a, a, a 6'3 or 6'4 point guard who's going out to UBC uh, next year, um, who could post up smaller players and was very effective in that, um, in that role. So this, this happens a lot. Um, uh, the Warriors did it a lot with uh, Sean Livingston um, when, he was, uh, when he was not retired yet. Um, the uh, Oklahoma Thunder did it a couple of times with, uh, with Westbrook and there's lots of, of teams that, that do it. It's very simple, but also it's just another progression that makes it very, um, very effective. So I guess, should we try and do the video here or is that what's killing it? Well, uh, yeah, it seems like the video, like I'm, I'm able to see it. It's a little chunky. I don't know if everyone else is seeing the same thing, but give it a whirl and, and, and see. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Here we go. So we've got um, ball reversal, back screen, and then we enter it into the post. And again, there should be a flare screen on the other side. Those two guys always forget. Um, but we, we like to enter it from our center to the, use the center to enter it. He was a, a reasonable passer. Um, and he, it also, the center's defensively typically don't put a lot of pressure in the ball so it makes it a pretty uh, pretty entry pass pretty easy entry pass coach is it always a flare uh, and then the fourth always a flare on the weak Sorry? side always a flare on the weak side never a pin down or anything 
So I, I mean, it, if for me, again, it depends a bit on the personnel. I, if, if I have um, uh, a guard to guard uh, in the, on the weak side, then it's always a flare. If I had a, a player that couldn't shoot it or was particularly, uh, you know, a bigger kid, then when he was at the top, we would pin down. And when he was in the corner, we would flare. Um, so you, I like to, like when they, when they penetrate baseline, um, flare the guy into the corner uh, and throw the baseline pass, kind of like the hammer action that the Spurs would, would run a lot, um, where you get the two defenders looking at the ball and uh, you force the defender that's playing here to come and help for lob or for... Um, for uh, to for to stop dribble penetration, and you come up and ba uh, flare screen this guy here, and that leaves this whole area when your guy attacks baseline. It, it becomes such an easy um, uh, easy three point shot, and I think corner shots are are you know statistically one of the better ones. So the more you the more you get for me, the the better it is. So if it's a four and a three, we go pin down to here, um, and then like a slip. Uh, to the to the rim for the four and if it's the four in the corner then we would flare and have the three going there like what I've drawn uh, like what I've drawn there and they're just asking the timing on that um, one of our uh, attendees is asking the timing on that flare screen um, so again that's uh, the it, it's it's got to have a bit of feel to it it's kind of a bad answer but um, it's got to happen um, when the defense is engaged and looking at the ball and your shooter should arrive in the corner um, when this guy gets like picks up the ball so that that guy's got to be able to pick up the ball and know that he can throw that thing baseline and there's a guy standing there or um, throw the throw the over the head pass back to the 45 and there's a guy standing there um, this one that we're looking at the, the last action um, where you have your your big guy rolling to the middle, uh, he, he's going to set a backside. Well, he goes to go from the beginning. He's going to go pin down here, and then your one guy's popping up here, and we try and enter it. If you can't enter it, now the five's coming back to set that backside screen like this. Um, so you want that one attacking the rim, your big guy rolling to the rim, which almost always forces the uh, corner defender to try and come and help. And when that corner defender comes to try and help, his offensive player will come and set the flare screen. So as that one guy attacks and his corner defender starts to help in here, that's when the flare screen's got to happen. Um, and that, that guy drifting to the corner is, is just wide open um, uh, almost every time. If you know if people want to, if you Google Spurs hammer, um, it's, it's about as good a play as I think you can find. And, and Ginobili is just constantly hitting threes after Boris Dio uh, pins in guys on the, on the, on the back side there. Um, so we got one little, little bit here that, that hopefully will show this. We kind of run this action twice on this clip. So it's a kind of bad screens all the way around, but here's the down screen where he peeks over his shoulder and that's where we would try and get it, get it in there is on the, on the, when the big guy's looking. So right right now they should have been flaring. You see these two players are, are totally engaged in this. This corner defender has, has to come and help out on this guy. So what we've essentially done is we've created a scenario where you've got three defensive players guarding two offensive players, which means that you've got these two guys trying to guard these three guys. And right now, as this guy attacks the baseline, here's, here's our guard, so he's going to pop. This guy's going to step up ideally into this spot right here. This defender has got to stop the dribble penetration. And if this guy will come and pin in uh, right there, then the number three will be just wide open in the corner. And either you shoot that ball or, or attack from there. Um, here's uh, the backside screen. So where the big, um, the big kid will have set the down screen. And then he's going to come. He looks in the post for a little bit too long, but then he's going to come up and set the, um, the backside ball screen which is one of my favorite uh, favorite actions here. So he's coming up. We have good spacing. We forget to pin again. So again, you see like he takes this crazy shot and makes it. But um, if we pin in on the backside there, then we're going to get a wide open kick out. I, I'm sorry I can't pause it for you, but you get this attack. Everyone's looking at the ball, and you've got a wide open shot. Because the big guy um, 
because the big guy attracts so much attention when he rolls to the rim, it forces that defense to collapse. And if you can get people to make the right decision, um, then you're, uh, you're, in, you're in good shape. Um, so the next thing that I was hoping to, to talk about was the ways to get into it. Um, I didn't get any video attached to it, so maybe that's better. But there's, there's five uh, essential ways to get into it. Um, and then the sixth one is is just reversing the ball, and you can repeat any of those fives on the op any of those fives options on the other side uh, side of the floor. I know we're close to yeah, ten minutes, so I'll try and do this quickly, and then maybe a couple questions at the end. If uh, yeah, we we, got we, one. we can go a little bit longer, coach, because we we had a couple okay. as well. So a couple hiccups. Yeah. No um, <laughs> so the this is the the most basic one, and what we saw at the beginning. Uh, and here's here's what you're you were asking. So here we have the four guy coming to pin down and the three guy coming up instead of the other way around because um, because the four is a little bit bigger than the three in theory. So the one the one pushes the ball up the floor and that's the question that was asked before. Do you pass it up the floor or dribble up the floor? If you can pass it up the floor, it just it puts so much more pressure on the defense. Um, so pass that thing up whenever you can. Um, your five guy is trailing in to to set the screen. Uh, and here, the first one is the two guy fakes the handoff to the one, uh, and then the two uses the ball screen himself, um, which creates the strong side on this side, the weak side on that side. You've had a little misdirection over there, um, and then uh, what ends up what ends up happening is your twos come off the the ball screen, and is looked for the five at the slip, reverses the ball to the one, and and this it's really got to go back to the strong side. There's not usually a lot on this side, although if you, as you get better, sometimes you can get stuff. Um, and then here comes the, the action that we just saw, the, the, the last key action, the backside screen, where one guy is attacking the rim, the five guy is rolling hard, four guy comes back up and tries to pin in, and we force this help defender to play in here and try and get the ball to there. And, and you know, one of the things I guess I should have said before, um, for me, like you're trying to create an opportunity to attack a bad closeout and play off of that. So if you get this ball to here, you know, if you don't shoot it, that's fine. They're going to have to close out hard and maybe you make the extra pass to here. And now you're just playing. And the, the first pistol action will give you or hopefully create some kind of advantage just to, for them to break down defensively. And then you really got to start, um, you got to let your players just, just go. And, and like I said, with four, like if you have four guys on the, the, the floor that can pass, dribble and shoot, and that's probably the toughest thing, uh, toughest thing to defend. So the second one uh, is the, the, the middle ball screen, the DHO to the middle ball screen. Um, so same thing, ball gets passed up the floor, hand it to the one, or the ball can get dribbled up the floor. The one guy uses the two screen and it's the two flares. Um, your two flares over the top. Again, you see the floor is just so open in the middle so that if they overplay this flare screen, that five can slip and it's a, it's a very easy, um, very easy layup. If not, the two guy pops out. And now you've got that five guy chasing back to the screen. Um, once you get that screen set here, same thing on the back side, flare screen, um, and the two guys attacking the rim. One guy is going to the to the the corner for some space, and your five is rolling uh, is rolling to the rim. Um, the next one, guard to guard ball screen. So that's when we saw the same thing. I just, you know, exactly what we just did. Instead of, um, instead of passing it up, you're dribbling it up. Results in the flare screen. Um, and the same, same action where you have the two coming downhill, the five roll, and then the flares on the, on the back side, which is this. Flares on the back side, two attacking downhill. Um, so after, you know, teams that scout and get used to it, they're going to start taking away this spot here. So you can't use that ball screen. You can't pass it up. Um, it, it starts to get clogged up. And one of the things actually that's, that's important and hard for the players to understand is that two guy has got to get off the sideline. So you've got to be like in this area here so that the one can go to the baseline uh, close to the sideline and there's no option to go to the to the sideline, then it just kills it immediately. So I, I mean, I, I put an X on the floor with tape <laughs> so that they know where to stand. Otherwise, they just, they just always forget. Um, but for this one, the ball gets uh, passed to the five, and then we get into the back screen. And that's how you get into that key action um, is ball reversal. And that's an easy pressure, um, pressure release as well so that, um, 
if if they get over uh, you know they overcompensate for for uh, for this action, then this kind of relieves the pressure. And once once we got better at it and more familiar with it, we added a couple other wrinkles where the ball would go the other way, and you can you know you guys can can change it up as as you see fit. But this was our our pressure release, um, along with. Uh, it's, it's, so back to same thing. It, it always you always end up in in one of those key um, key actions. The last way to get into is with the drag screen. So same thing. Sometimes you know they put a ton of pressure on the ball as the as the one guys bring the ball up the floor, and you just get your five to set a drag screen, and that allows the one to get off there pretty easily. Uh, after the five sets the screen, you're always going to go uh, down screen, and that's one of the one of the important rules that the fives need to learn is that. After they set uh, a screen in the middle of the in the middle of the floor, when there's a corner filled, they are always going to go look for that screen. We're never turning the corner into the into the side that has two players and having a big roll. If we're turning the corner this way, we're not even turning the corner. It's total misdirection. We're going to go try and screen here, throw it back to the two on this side, and then get the backside screen, which is coming right here, which is what I always like to end up with, the big roll into the rim, backside screen, players on the other uh, other side. Um, so that is pretty much, um, pretty much that. Um, we have, uh, you know, I had, a, you know, a couple other things, but I think probably if, if uh, questions are up there, it's probably the best time to, to do that. Sure. Yeah, Coach, we had a question just about uh, in transition, does your big not run to the rim or is it always trail to drag or always pistol? Um, I know that that's confusing for some people with pistol just because it's a weird setup, right? Yeah, I, so I no, I, the big, unless, the only exception would be if for some reason he's out in front of the pack, like obviously go and score the layup. Um, but I, I mean, one of the, one of the, I guess things that I, you know, when I played, the big guy was supposed to get the rebound and then sprint down that floor a, a thousand miles an hour and, and get to the rim. But I, I guess over the years that's changed for me. Um, I find having the, I, I ran that drill so many times uh, when I was playing, and I don't know if I can remember a time when I was playing in a game and I and the big scored running the rim. You know, it, they're slow, um, and they they typically don't really like to run the whole way and then they're slow back so I I let our big guy trail and rebound the ball trail the floor set a good screen if he's going to score it's going to be in the later portions of the of the shot clock um, and I find in the earlier like the the early transition like on the give and go you don't want your big guy up there you want that rim as clear as um, as clean as possible uh, but again to run this or to make this work, you need long, athletic, um, you know, the ideal 6'4", 6 6'6", 6 6 6 kind of guys with guard skills that are not um, rebounders who rebound when the ball falls to them to take, to take up a lot of space, but they're rebounders who will track a three and go get a rebound um, or just or just uh, just run back, but we didn't. We don't. We don't rebound a lot um, of our our early transition threes um, with the with our big guy at all. You know, we only rebound them um, with the guards. But again, to me, that makes sense because a lot of your your threes are going to be long rebounds, and you just ask your big guy to sprint up the floor and watch the ball bounce over his head, and then he's got to run back down, and it's it's just not playing to his um, to his strength. Yep. <clears throat> that that makes sense. Um, Question about number uh, entry number three. Can you go back to that slide first, just so we can um, yep. get that one? There's a few more questions coming in as well, so that's good. Yep. Okay, perfect. Um, so they just wanted to, uh, you to go over entry three again. If you could go start just a quick version of that. Uh, yep. Um, so the third the third one is um, is when you're dribbling at your your guard, and this one is the one that that happens the most commonly. Um, it, it can be very effective. What, what you need to be careful with is when this guy dribbles up the floor here, oh, maybe I can go to the present the whole thing. Um, when this guy dribbles up the floor here, um, nine times out of 10, they're gonna try and, try and turn the corner. Um, and that is not gonna be available because nine times out of 10, the two guys defender switches onto that. And that's why I put this little arrow here because it happens so often. So this guy, when he's attacking, He's getting to here 
and he's going to bounce it out. There's, there's not going to be a, a, an easy attack for him. If he wants to, if he wants to score, he's got to pass the ball up the floor and then sprint. The reason I like that one better is because when this guy makes the pass, his defender often relaxes. And if you make that pass and really sprint, it puts yourself uh, in a good position. But so in this, in this one, guard to guard, you come up the floor, the two guys setting a screen, the one guy bounces it out. Um, usually they switch. And because they've switched, this flare screen becomes very effective. So now you can throw the ball over the top. And that's where we saw um, the guard shoot the ball and, and, and right away. Or um, come back and uh, you have your middle ball screen which gets you back into the action, you know, the, one of the four key actions where you've got your big rolling to the rim, this guy spacing out the floor, um, and the backside uh, screens happening. Perfect. <laughs> um, another question. Uh, the catch, catch the ball at the 45 on the pass ahead, do you like that deeper or is it always 45? Do you care where the spacing is on the pass ahead um, out of transition to the... I assume... Yeah. So... It shouldn't really be the 45 even. The 45 is too close to the sideline. Like I assume people, when they say 45, they're thinking like here. Um, and, uh, and that often ends up being more like here, which means that you can't get any of this sideline action. So it, it, like if you're going to do this, tape, tape an X on the floor like here. So foul line extended or even a little bit higher is not, is not bad either. But you need to have... 15, 12 feet between the sideline and where you catch um, so that you ha can have your one guy coming like this or your one guy coming and bouncing off with the, with the ball in the, in the one that we just saw, the, the third option. If that screen is too close here, then they, they just trap it every time or more often than not, your guy just dribbles up the floor and dribbles off his feet and goes out of bounds. Um, so I really try, it's a weird position. It's one of the toughest things to change about the, the player's habits is the two guy wants to run up the floor and stand in the corner and wait for the ball. But he really needs to run up to about this area and then turn and come hard. It's like, um, it's like a comeback route in, in football. You're, you're sprinting hard to here, you're turning and coming back to meet that ball. And if you can time it, it's, it's almost impossible to, to prevent the ball from getting to there. And then you fake this way and then you would be coming back to use that trail ball screen from the five. <laughs> That's great stuff, coach. I think, I think you hit on another one there. So, um, we've ran, this is a personal question. This isn't someone else's. We've ran a little bit of pistol. Um, and you talked about the spacing, getting too far to the side, dribbling it off your feet. What we found is some teams would be super aggressive and trap all the action out of the pistol. What are ways that you work on that in practice to combat that? Are you just slipping right away? Is there a read on the shoulders or what are you telling your guys, um, when you face trapping teams in pistol? So I, I, the number one thing is, is we would try and use the two outlets, the option four and five, where we drag screen, um, drag screen the, with the trail or ball reverse. Um, the other one, uh, and it's kind of, again, why I like it, the pistol so much, but the easiest way is if you really get the ball up fast, it's very hard for them to trap. If you're, if you're slow and walk the ball three, four dribbles and then make that pass up the floor or dribble it, walk it up the whole way and, and you know, you got a team uh, two defenders standing there beside each other yelling red, 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 like it, you're going to be in trouble. Um, so in those scenarios, when, when for whatever reason we, we had to walk it up, um, what we tried to do is when we get to about this area, we reverse the floor entirely and then just run it on the other side. Um, to be honest, we never got too good at, at, at doing that. Um, but that, that to me is the, the way to beat that. I think if you do, I mean, if they trap that and you slip your two, it's an awfully tough pass to try and get it in there. And then when he catches, he's going to be, he's going to be, um, he's going to be facing the, the big and a lot of help at the rim. So if they, if they're trapping, I, I don't love the slip. I, I try and go like invite the trap a little bit, reverse the floor and then go attack on the other, uh, on the other side. Okay. And after you break down out of the pistol, are you letting your guys play? Or are you going back to screen and roll? If you run pistol and get to your mid screen and roll, probably the ending of your offense. But it, if you go pistol and you don't get anything on the hammer, um, yeah. are you spacing principles? What are you guys doing out of that? So basically um, what we do is in this exact scenario, for example, when, when the two guy gets, gets into here and can't give it to the five and, um, and then kicks it back out to the, um, to the three, we always replace the, 
the strong side. So the guy that, that kicked the ball out is going back to the side where he came from. Um, and then what we try and do is either the, the three guys got one second to make his decision. He's going to either pass it uh, to the four and then the four shoot it. He's going to attack a bad closeout or he's going to shoot it himself. If he hasn't made that decision in the first second, then what's happening for us is the five guy is starting to drop out from here. Our two guy will have replaced the corner. And then we're coming and setting the, this blur screen with a four. So the four guy will come to here for blur screen. And the five guy will trail behind for ball screen on the back side again. And that gets us back into the back side, uh, the back side ball screen. Um, and, you know, if they screw up the, the blur screen, then it gives you a, a pretty good option, um, an option to throw it to there and then, and then go and attack. Um, I, you know, if we can get one of those pistol to drive and kick and some action off the drive and kick, then, then I would be, uh, I'd be pretty happy. Um, I, it's a fine line between too much freedom and, and not enough freedom. And I think that's where, where, you know, for me, like, when you do a good job coaching, the players are, are, um, are able to make those decisions. And, and that's probably what I spend most of my time in practice working on is, is in this, in this offense is making decisions. So when we, when we practice, we, we do a lot of like semi defense, uh, semi live defense where they're just getting used to reading whether the player slipped, uh, whether the defensive team switched, whether the defensive team hedged, um, and trying to practice those decisions and, and, for, you know, for kids coming from high school, I, I don't even like they, they don't even understand the difference between if, it, if a team is switching the ball screen or, or hedging the ball screen or doubling the ball screen. And, and to make those decisions in live um, in live play is really, really hard. Um, and I think it requires a, a, just a ton of, of reps. So for me, we go um, we go skeleton a lot to get the patterns really uh, memorized and, and figured out. Um, and then the next step is like the dummy defense, 60%, 70% where they're reading what the defense does. And then the last, um, the last step is really, uh, is really live. I think anytime you have access to film or, or as a coach, if you have access to film, the more film that you can watch uh, with the players and have the players watch on their own, it, it's so beneficial to them because, I mean, it's crazy how many times players come off and, and just been furious with me because – what I'm saying is wrong and, and doesn't make any sense. And then we go back and watch the film and they're like, Oh, Oh, actually he was switching every time. Yeah. And, and when they see it on the film and they see them do it themselves, do it on the film, I think they start to gain trust in what the coach is saying. And that, you know, most of the time we're not just making stuff up and, and it, it helps them see the game, uh, see the game better. Yeah, no, <laughs> that makes sense. It's always hard to get through the players. Sometimes film always teaches them the answers. Hey, eh? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's it's your best ally because it doesn't lie. It, it, it you know, I the most common one for me actually isn't it doesn't have anything to do with uh, with strategy or anything. It's yeah, coach, I was sprinting a hundred percent up the floor as fast as I could go, and then you get the old clock out and it you know <laughs> it take it takes them seven seconds across. Oh, maybe I wasn't really going as fast. As I, yeah, okay, that's that's great. Um, coach, before we wrap up here, do you have your contact info on this slide show that I could share? If not, we're gonna uh, put it up. No, there. I didn't put it on there, but I can uh, I can definitely do that, and uh, I can send it to you, and I can send you the the presentation. Like I have no issue with people uh, if if people want to take that. Yeah, so you're okay with me sharing your email so they can ask you more questions on this at, at another date. Absolutely. Okay. There's also. Um, Go ahead. Sorry. There's also. Um, I mean, obviously, if you just if you just start googling pistol, there's there's. They're the Dallas Mavericks probably right now, I think are the best team, uh, best team to watch for, for that stuff. Obviously having Porzingis and uh, Luca make things a lot better, but they really run some nice options out of it. Um, there's a couple nice uh, other cuts of, of stuff on YouTube. The NBA stuff is a little bit, uh, it's not quite the same um, uh, as, as I think what like kind of pure pistol is because the NBA players are, are just so talented that they make, they make crazy shots that, that are not good shots. Um, but there is a ton of, a ton of things on, um, on, on pistol. Um, and from, from way, kind of way back uh, at UCLA, there's a lot of good stuff too, that, that takes them 
work to get through. It's a little bit tedious, but it is a pretty uh, interesting thing. That's great. That's awesome. So we'll, we'll share your information on this. Um, I want to thank you coach for taking the time out to do this. I know we had some glitches, but it was great stuff for all those that's hung on for us. Um, I know you got other things you could be doing and thanks for everyone else that followed along today. You guys feel free to follow us basketball immersion and golden ticket sports on social media, check out the offers uh, that come along with this clinic and tomorrow we will have another full slate. So from there, once again, thanks coach again, and um, we'll let these guys go and, and have our evening. Perfect. Uh, I see there's one last uh, question there, so I'll try and answer that. Uh, what if the defense just switch at the split and wait for the pass in the corner? Or if he stays in the paint, the defense rotates or only offense? I'm not sure if I understand that question. Yeah, what well, if the I, was having, I was having trouble with that one as well. I saw the question pop up there. Um, I'm assuming that they, split. they're saying after the, the um, pick and roll part, do you have to kick to the corner if you don't have the hammer or what your option is? I believe I wasn't quite clear on that one. So I didn't want to oh. leave you with that. Cause I believe that's after you come to the middle pick and roll is what I believe. Right. Yeah. And then, well, I mean, so after the middle pick and roll, if that person is still there, um, once, once we, we, we try and space out enough so that we can always kick it out um, and you kick it out to your, your, um, your guy in the corner or your guy at the 45 and then we would go into blur screen ball screen uh, from that yeah that that makes sense. <laughs> it gives it a different thank you uh, yeah thank you uh thank you very much for the opportunity it was uh it was uh it was fun and uh, i look forward to hearing the rest of the speakers as well okay thanks so much and have a great night coach all right take care all the best